by bus, by train, or Metrolink. GMPTE, proud sponsors of I Love Manchester, connecting people with places throughout Greater Manchester. Welcome to I Love Manchester, our guide to the successes and secrets of our city. Manchester. Today I'm visiting two Manchester institutions, the Bridgewater Hall, one of Manchester's finest concert venues, and the Halle Symphony Orchestra, who use this acoustic venue as their home. I'll also be chatting to local classical musician Wayne Marshall and to the Halle's archivist about why this is such a special year for them. Opened in 1996, this impressive building seats over 2,000 music lovers. And with its main auditorium specially designed by architect Renton Howard Wood Levin and our acoustics to provide the highest quality oral experience, this is indeed the best location in Manchester to indulge your audiophile tendencies. With a bust commemorating Sir John Barbaroli, the conductor of the Halle Orchestra for nearly three decades, situated just outside, it's no surprise that this is the modern home of the historic and renowned Halle Orchestra. And to find out more, I spoke to Eleanor Roberts, the archivist of the Halle Orchestra. Ellen, a big year for you here this year. Yes, indeed. We are 150 um, and it's been very busy but very exciting. So 150 years ago, how did you become the first professional symphony orchestra? Uh, Sir Charles Halle um, put in um, a bid, if you like, to run the music for the Manchester Arts Treasures exhibition in 1857. And so during that exhibition had organised um, a professional orchestra to come and play. Um, and it basically didn't want to see it go. So he decided to try his own subscription series of proper symphony concerts with a full-scale orchestra. He also put the players on a contract for the whole of that series and that was why we basically think of ourselves as being the first professional symphony orchestra. Charles Halle was an amazing conductor but he wasn't from Manchester was he? He wasn't. He was born in Germany um, and he um, was born into a musical family, uh, was um, well could have been a child prodigy um, in terms of his piano playing and as a young man went to Paris um, where he met musicians such as Berlioz and Chopin. However, in 1848, uh, Paris erupted in revolution, uh, so he went to London. At that point in time, uh, a Manchester uh, merchant called Herman Leo wrote to him and said, have you thought of Manchester? Um, and Halle said, well, all right, if you can find me sufficient pupils to actually earn my living, then yes, I'll come and I will also see what else I can do, you know, kind of musically for Manchester. Where was the first concert? In the Free Trade Hall on the 30th of January in 1858. And what do you think of your new home here now? I think it's beautiful mm -hmm. from the outside and in. Um, I don't, I never knew the old Free Trade Hall, um, so I haven't really got that to compare it with. I know there are members of our audience who um, look back on concerts there with a great deal of affection um, because I, I think it felt a little bit more intimate um, than, than the Bridgewater. But the sound that you achieve in the Bridgewater is just second to none, so it's wonderful to be here. So throughout the 150th year anniversary, what have you got planned? Um, well, obviously we had a huge celebration on the 30th of January itself um, with a special concert. Um, and during the course of the year, we've revisited some pieces which the Halle gave the um, world premiere for, or English premiere. Um, and that's kind of been a theme that's run throughout. As archivist, what does your job entail? Well, I look after the um, historic records um, of the Halle Concert Society, really. Uh, I do have some material that relates to Sir Charles Halle personally. Are these some of the significant items that you have? Yes. Um, I thought it might be nice uh, to see this, for example, which is a copy of the programme for that first concert 
on the 30th of January. And this is the original? It is, yeah. Mm. doesn't look too bad, does it? No, for it's in very good <laughs> condition. And two shillings and sixpence for a reserved seat. That's quite cheap. Yeah, but you see, the gallery in the body of the hall, unreserved, is a shilling. So. Oh, wow. um, but as you can see, all the uh, players are listed, mm -hmm. and um, that's why really the programmes are so important to us because they, they don't just provide evidence of what we've played um, but for, um, well most really of the first 75 years or so of the orchestra's existence they're also the personnel record. And what do we have here? Um, well this is one of our oldest items. Um, Seymour was um, the leader in uh, that first orchestra that Sir Charles mm -hmm. Halley started mm -hmm. um, and we call this the Seymour scrapbook. There's one of my favourite items in here which if you can see this little house here yeah. written alongside it's signed by Charles Halley at the bottom there and uh, dated the 23rd of October 1857 and alongside um, is written by Seymour that after coming to a gloomy conclusion which is underlined as to the possibility of making grand orchestral concerts successful in Manchester in a pecuniary sense. The reason I like that is because I think you get a real picture of, of um, well at least two men, I suspect that the one or two others were there as well, sitting around a table calculating mm -hmm. how many tickets they needed to sell, what they could pay the orchestra, what they had to pay the hall. And here's Charles Halley, desperate to do this for all sorts of reasons, with head in hands, scribbling away on this little corner, thinking, is this going to work or not? Now I'll be experiencing some of the acoustics here at the hall later in the programme. But first, it's over to a famous Mancunian who made their mark on Manchester and the rest of the world. Lady Anne Bland was born in 1664. She was actually born Anne Mosley. She was a daughter of the Mosley family. The Mosley family who were lords of the manor of Manchester, who actually owned Manchester in its entirety until the middle of the 1800s. So she was a true Mancunian. The Mosley family have had a slightly strange family history, but at her time, when she was born, she was the only daughter, and consequently she inherited the whole estate when her father died. Now, the Mosleys lived, they had a couple of homes around Manchester, and at the time, just prior to her being born, they would have lived out in Charleston Medlock. So when they used to come into the city of Manchester to worship at the church, the church they came to was the Collegiate Church, which we now know as the Cathedral. Anne Mosley, as she was then, met Lord John Bland, married, and as seemed to be the case in those days, well, it was the case, husband appropriated all of the fortune, and when Anne inherited from her father, husband was really rubbing his hands in glee, inherited the lot. She had two sons who unfortunately took after the father in that they were both desperate gamblers. He managed to lose a great amount of Anne's fortune and it demonstrates her fortitude really how she could salvage some of her fortune and she hung on to some of the money. And Anne was a follower of the Hanoverians. So she was basically low church. She worshipped at the collegiate church, which was reckoned to be quite high church, and it was also there where the Jacobites worshipped. And Anne was not particularly happy about this situation. Cross Street Chapel was built around this time, and Anne preferred to worship at dissenters' chapel, nonconformists, than she did to worship at the collegiate church. Being a lady of means, she thought that to solve the problem of these conflicts between the two factions, high church and low church, she would try and acquire land and build her own church. And that's in fact what she did. She had to apply to acquire a piece of land in what was then Acres Field. Acres Field was a small area, now St Anne's Square of course, where the annual fair was held. And this was quite a, an achievement that she was able 
to acquire a piece of land with the proviso that she could build a church at one end and leave the other greater part of the field open for use by the general public. So she built her church, named it after herself and the monarch of the time who was by that time Queen Anne. When the church was built, it was built with a dome. The dome was deemed to be unsafe and it was changed to a spire. The spire was deemed to be even more unsafe than the dome, so they eventually took the lot down and left it as a tower and had created a middle-of-the-road church. So it was an Anglican church that was just in between the, non the really low church of the nonconformists and the higher church that was going on at the collegiate church, now the cathedral. So she became, she was always a native Mancunian, but she gave Manchester another of our iconic buildings in St Anne's Church. And she also laid out the square and gave us one of our few open areas in St Anne's Square. Lady Anne Bland died in 1734, and she and various other members of the Mosley family are buried in Disbury Church. And unfortunately, there are no other memorials to her. We just have the church. Thanks, Jean. Now do join us after the break when I'll be meeting a classical musician who hails from Oldham, who has the world at his feet, or more accurately, his fingers. GMPTE, connecting people with places throughout Greater Manchester. Welcome back. Now, the Bridgewater Hall is well known for its acoustics, but one of the features you might not know so much about is the 5,500 pipe organ, which is one of the main focal points in the auditorium. And one man who has the talent to use it is organist and pianist Wayne Marshall. Hello, Wayne. You're also yeah. the organist in residence. What does that mean? Well, basically, um, I'm you know, more or less in charge of the organ. I mean, I'm the, I'm the person here who, you know, I'm, I, I play here. I organize a recital series here and I mean I've been here really since the building was built so you know it's over 10 years now so it's been fantastic to, to have had that position. And you're well known worldwide for being an organist and pianist but you are from Oldham. I am indeed yes indeed. It doesn't sound like it but I certainly am from Oldham. So how did you get into this? Well you know the thing is that I started to play uh, keyboard from a very early age and started to play the organ from the age of 11 and um, I went to Sheetham School of Music here in Manchester and then to the Royal College of Music in London. Um, but music is what I've always wanted to do and so you know, playing the organ is something which I enjoy and, and of course having this position is fantastic because at least it gives me a kind of focal point as, a, as an organist and people know that I'm here. Um, I mean I wish I could be here more often but it's, it's a great position to have and I'm very proud of course being from, from Oldham and uh, being an organist in residence here. And the organ here, 5,500 pipes is quite a lot, isn't it? What's the art and technology that's gone into this? Well, I mean, like any new organ, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a very complicated instrument. I mean, there's so many moving parts, so many pipes, as you mentioned, and uh, this particular organ here was built by the Danish organ builder, Markusen. And it's, uh, it has two, two points where one can play it, two consoles, in fact, one which is fixed at the top there, and one here, which is the one which we generally tend to use. It gives different musical instrument sounds, doesn't it? Well, the organ is like an orchestral, is like an orchestral instrument. I mean, so many different sounds, can, you know, in, 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 in the instrument, and it's a, it's a very complex instrument to play. Um, but it it gives it gives a lot of satisfaction once it's when it's played properly. So, for you, why is this hall so special? Well, it's special because uh, I mean, obviously, you know, coming from the northwest, uh, I was I actually remember seeing this this as a building site, and so from that time on. Uh, I've watched the place grow and develop, and many many events have happened here. Uh, I played many recitals here, and uh, a lot of players have, have have played here. So it's 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 a, it's a kind of homecoming base for me. So it's, it's it's wonderful. You've played in many places across the world. How does the hall and organ compare with those venues? Oh, it's a it's a fantastic. I mean, the organ is very beautiful. It's it's a, a fabulous sound, and I you know really enjoy it. And and there's, even one can get a lot of great colours out of it. Um, the, and the other thing to remember, of course, is that no two organs are the same. I mean, there are other organs by Markerson, but very different to sounding from, from this one. Um, and when you're performing here, 
What's the atmosphere like? What's the feeling that people get if they come to a concert here at the Hall? Well, I think that the Bridgewater Hall, I mean, is, it's a place where one can really see and experience uh, great music making. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, intimate atmosphere. I mean, it, it seats 2,400 people, this hall. Uh, one has the organ as a focal point. You know, one has to come to entertain the audience, and that's my main, that's my main purpose as a, as a musician, is to entertain and to make uh, concert going as enjoyable as possible. Well, considering you are here today and you're not always back in Manchester, would you mind performing for us? Absolutely. Thank you. Now, as I leave Wayne to stretch his fingers for tonight's performance, it's time for Steve Shelyaski's final item as he travels around Manchester tasting beer. Well, someone's got to do it. During this series of Isle of Manchester, I have visited some of the best local breweries, but there are a few other nations who can also boast long and illustrious brewing histories, but to taste them you needed a passport and a lot of bus money. Until now, because a bar has been set up in Altrincham which boasts a selection of over 200 continental and British beers. I took my taste buds and my children's college trust fund along to find out more. So I'm in a, I'm in a beautiful, antiquated, underground bar. Uh, a very Parisian feel to it, but we're not in Paris, we're in Altrincham. Yes, down a back street next to the market behind the hospital. And it's got an unusual name, Mort Savit. Mort Savit. It means sudden death, obviously, because it used to be the morgue downstairs, here. This used to be the morgue? This used to be the morgue down here. Upstairs was the pathology lab. Of Altrium Hospital. Altrium Hospital. So it must have yeah. took some cleaning. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so you have 250 beers uh, for selection. Where are they from? All European. So we've, we've checked Germany, Austria, uh, France, yeah. um, and obviously Belgium. And do you have any uh, English beers? Yeah, we've got quite a good selection of beers from England, from all over Great Britain actually, yeah. uh, from Dunham Massey Farms, he's a local brewery sort of three miles away all the way up to Scotland, there's, there's a Welsh beer, Welsh Pride. Okay, so someone comes into the bar, there's 250 beers, how do they know what to choose from? They get the book of knowledge, the menu, it all starts with a draft and then right. it goes on to the, because the majority of people really like to start off with the draft, they, they see the taps and you know it's quite, mm. quite an interesting thing to have a look at. We go on to the French stuff, Czech, Dutch, uh, German. Um, Austrian, Great Britain, and then obviously finishing off with, with the Belgian list. So to discover more about this book of knowledge and hopefully taste a drink or two, or three, I spoke to Wynne Rees, who knows a bit about beer. So hello Wynne. Hi Steve, you well? I, I find you stood by the book of knowledge. Of course. And you've selected, course. you've selected three beers, I believe you're going to make me a very happy man. Well we certainly are with these three beers we have now. first beer we're going to taste is called Slap Musker Blonde. Where's it from? It's actually from uh, Ghent in Belgium. Um, so quite a regional style of beer, but quite distinct. Okay. And it's just won the Golden Glass Award at the World Beer Festival in Zwevegen. It's very light, mm. but really hoppy. So that comes from the use of the Belgian hops, mm. which give it a little bit of bitterness. Right. So very refreshing, just with a slight citrus hint in there. Right. So this next beer. The second beer. And this is the Ertel Hoppit. Again, from another award-winning brewer. What Hildegard did with this beer, right. um, she produced a triple-style beer. And the triple hopping in this particular case uses the three types of hop. So, with it being so hoppy, I'm expecting quite a floral taste. Is that right? You will get a slight floral taste at the beginning, but because of the extreme hop she used in this, there's actually a very bitter, bone-dry finish. That's uh, strong. At 9% as well, you certainly can taste the alcohol. Yeah. That's for sure. This final beer is from one of the Trappist monasteries still brewing. There are only seven in the world still producing beer. Right. For this one, they've done a seasonal beer, which is a Bock beer. Yeah. So this is a much more a darker, more intense, sweeter, richer beer. So we're using a lot of dark malts in here. So yeah. the hints you're getting are toffee, caramel, yeah. burnt coffee aromas. Yeah. Very, com very complicated. Edward, you're quite right. I mean, it's a good, a good analogy for some of these styles of beers. Mm. Complex. And unlike some other beers, there's no cloyingness, so there's no residual sweetness. You know, it really is a beer you could, you could drink a lot of. 
Well, that's it for my investigation into tasting fine ale in Manchester for this series. It's been hard, back-breaking work, followed by a lot of trips home on the 192 bus. Incidentally, I start my training for the next series of brewery tours this weekend. Thanks, Steve. Now, if you live in Greater Manchester and are going on holiday this year, then you'll no doubt appreciate the fact that we have an international airport right on our doorstep, Manchester Airport. And it seems the Halle aren't the only ones to be celebrating a special anniversary this year. Russell, I've got to say, I'm very excited being on the airfield. It's fantastic, isn't it? There's no better place at the airport than standing in between the runways. <laughs> Great. Standing in between two big aircraft that really could just skim over the top of your head. <laughs> yes. But big year for you, though, isn't it? It's fantastic. 70th anniversary of Manchester Airport. So who'd have thought in 1938 that 70 years from now, be standing here, two runways, all that terminal behind us, all these aircraft. 70 years isn't really a long time for it to have developed the way it has. Well originally Manchester Airport began life as Barton Airport but the city forefathers had an awful lot of foresight where kind of Manchester as an international city was concerned so they brought the, the coast in with the ship canal into the city centre and then they decided to take the airport that was Barton and move it to this site which was called Ringway because they knew that this had the potential to make Manchester an international city. <laughs> Back in 1938, how many check-in desks were here? How many destinations did it serve? We had two check-in desks, believe it or not, in 1938 when it opened. Twelve destinations, only one of them was outside the UK, so it was largely domestic air travel. And about 4,000 passengers were served in the first year, so things have really, really changed. Well now, how many passengers do you serve? How many destinations? Nearly 23 million passengers a year fly from Manchester Airport to places all over the world, 225 destinations compared to those 12 in 1938. And now you've got two runways, three terminals. It is just a, it's a huge feat um, for people to have predicted back in the 30s the potential for this place and the importance it would have for the city. Manchester is an international city, you know, you, you have to ask questions about would you have somewhere like Chinatown if you didn't have an airport? Would you have companies like AstraZeneca, Google, the Bank of New York? If there weren't those air routes to the U US, to other destinations all over the world. So Manchester's heritage is an industrial city, the whole cultural aspect of the city. It's all predicated on having an international airport that's world renowned. Not only are you a gateway to the rest of the world for people and for people that want to come to Manchester, but you are in itself here at the airport a tourist attraction, aren't you? It is. I mean, the viewing park over there is, um, I think, the sixth most visited tourist attraction in the northwest. It's incredible. People do come here in their thousands every year to come and look at the aircraft. And because you've got airlines from all over the world that fly here, people do genuinely go on holiday to spot planes, and they come here to do it as well. I'll tell you all I want to do now is get on one of those planes. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's all from this series of I Love Manchester. I hope you've enjoyed watching. Well, I've got my bags packed, I've got the passport, and it's off to my next glamorous destination. But don't worry, I'm not going far, just going away for the weekend, so I'll see you soon on Channel M. I'll have a happy, happy holiday. <laughs> by bus, by train, or Metrolink. GMPTE, proud sponsors of Isle of Manchester, connecting people with places throughout Greater Manchester.